Hey, I guess we're the first or maybe the second? Second. Ah. Okay, that's what we're going to do. Yeah, finally,
So it'll take probably about 10 hours of work to make that thing. Hmm. And six of those hours are just pierced. You're going to cut the top, the door is separate as well, mm -hmm. the body, and then the bottom as well. But you never want to live above a tin shop because all you would hear all day long is that noise. And then that is, and then that is this pattern here. Mm -hmm. So if you were doing the lantern, you would just do it on your sheet. Yeah. These are the circle shears. This is for cutting tin. Right? Circle is for. So the bottom of that. Yeah. This one is the crimper. This is for getting these ruffled edges here. Is <laughs> All of these sheep are apparently endangered, less than 500 exist. Oh, I a rooster, huh? Hey! Hello! Lots of good stuff here, I'm guessing. I like to think so. The horses around as well? Yeah, the horses are just down the end of the road. Cool, we've been looking forward to seeing the horses. Their names are Rosie and Integra. Uh -huh. Two of them? Yes. Alright, we'll see them in a bit then. Sounds good. So what's the exhibit here for today? This is the saddle and harness maker. So, even though I'm sitting here stitching a baseball, traditionally it would have been something to do with the horse and harness. So it's kind of like the same stitching method? Yeah. Oh, okay. So. A baseball stitch is a little bit different, but uh, well, that one there is deer. Mm -hmm. The traditional saddle stitch, you have two needles in in if you want it to look pretty you always have to have the same you start on the same side oh, okay so if you notice i always started with the, the left hand left yeah hand, right right even though i'm right-handed <laughs> oh okay uh so that gives you a nice straight line if you don't really care and it just needs to work doesn't matter. Oh, okay. Completely separate threads going all the way through. Okay. So if the darker thread breaks, you still got one thread holding everything together. Oh, okay. With the, the lock stitch, which is something, well, the sleeve of your t-shirt is probably held on with a lock stitch. Oh, I get it. And that makes a lot of sense, actually. The, the threads lock in together. So when this one thread breaks, 
it just kind of falls, falls apart. apart. Yeah. We've all had that favorite t-shirt where the sleeve falls off or the side opens up. That's what's happened. So the hand stitch is kind of like two individual stitches. Yep. Lasque Emporium and Post Office. So apparently some ancient post office. But in the post office, there's something to buy. We post office, there's something to buy. See How? Hello, Turkey. Hello, Turkey. Hello, Turkey. And a turkey baby, too. There's one inside, too. Probably the female or male? I don't know. It's hard to tell. We've got ourselves a duck! Some endangered duck. And endangered chicken slash rooster things. A lot of them do actually. And they're all just kind of bunching up over here. I really like this one in the middle. I don't know what, what it's trying to do. It's kind of strange, actually. I'm just going to go take a closer look. Yeah. 
Dang, it's so beautiful. Yeah, and we, it's you know, like handmade. why do we need to use chemicals when we can get all these colors are from nature? They're just labeling things. Going up a really steep staircase. Oh, this is insanely steep. It's like pretty much straight. Mm. It's ready. It has to be fluffy like this. Okay. To so we have to card or brush it a lot. And we do that with these. You want to try it? I'll show you how to do it, and then you can try. It. See if you do it because kids used to help with this chore back then. So we just put some on. And then you have to hold this one like this and this one like this. So thumbs up and stop sign. And we do this. Do you want to try? That's it. So you tip this one a little bit. Just like that. Perfect. Do you think that would be a fun job? <laughs> For a little while. Yeah. And then you'd be like, Mom, why do I have to? I start it by turning the wheel and then I keep it going by oh, pressing the pedal. pedal. Yeah. Oh, okay. Nice. So it's 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 kind of a rhythm. Oh, okay. It's a bit like, you know, when you learn to ride a bike. Um oh. you don't forget. So I'm just oh. back here and stretching it a little bit and So this is making string. Yeah. This is So how do you get it to go evenly on the spool? So I have these little hooks and then I just move it. I see. So yeah, I should really move it over here, but I'm going to let it. Yeah. Is that looking interesting? I know. It's a, yeah, 16 years in that house. While they were clearing and getting ready to grow crops, they built the barn in 1825. And uh, during those 16 years in the little house, seven children were born. So then this one was built in 1832. And they lived in this house. Five generations of that family lived in this house right up until the 1950s. And the family was considered prosperous at the time. Yeah, they would have been prosperous. Um, they were able to hire um, servants man, and the like. Well, a man to help on the farm. Okay. So a, they called him a hired hand. Okay. But uh, yeah, so they they did quite well. And actually, we just had a visitor from that, a descendant from that family two days ago come here. To visit. Actual descendant. Yeah, yeah. So they come back, you oh, know. Okay. But they, yeah. Anyway, it's it's always interesting. But it's, this is owned by the government now. I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah, it's owned by the Toronto and Region Conservation yeah. Authority. Apparently this is Ceremonia Wigiham or something? I don't even know how to pronounce that. Wigiwam. Some sort of prayer place? I'm not really sure. So apparently they store a bunch of apples here. Obviously there's no apples now, but of Yuri.
都有噶Actual cooking. The fire it heats up the bricks and then you use the heat for the bricks. Okay. Bake some bread. Actual bread. If you go around the path, there's a ramp at the back that you can go up in with your stroller. Just follow the wood. This family, the Flynn's, was actually part, they're a different family. They came from Ireland. Okay. It's right after the Great Potato Famine. Okay. And they had, I believe, Let's see, five children right there. Okay. But they moved here and they, this house was originally by Young and Newton Brook. And there we have some music that you can listen to right. and explore the house. Alrighty. Yeah.
Historic horses, less than 500 in the world. They have really big hoofs, like massive. Do
Fine, it's a goose. This is a school. So it's like a school on the farm itself. There's like a lot of seats here. Like I'm guessing it's all the children on the farm as well as at the neighboring areas. They just come here as well. Yeah. So um, depending on how many families there were in the school district, uh, we try and build one school per village sort of thing. Um, and usually it would be enough for the students. If there were more children in this village than there were desks, what they had were these wooden planks that they would. Uh, placed across the seat so children could sit sort of in the aisle with their slates in their lap. They wouldn't have a proper desk. Oh, so they just like extend it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, the Upstairs is closed off, so I'm just gonna take a look at this. Why did 
前幾日有人出嚟啊嘛，有人喺度啊嘛。係啊。Bunny, turn this way. Yeah, go see that guy.
Mistletoe, one of the most common crops in Canada at this time. And by peeling and pouring them, we were able to use them to make preservatives. Because being able to have our food last many years was very, or last many months was very important at this time without refrigeration. Yeah, exactly. It is a cherry pitter. You'd be able to place a cherry there and push the pit out. And here's the. Then we also have. Look, you want us to learn. Any guesses what this might be used to? Well, yeah. we did. We should have some special. Well, yes, but I'm not sure if they're able to do it. We yeah. might help, but. We saw some of them. Yeah. Yeah. And. Uh, in the spinners. Well, what would we be cleaning with this? Yes, this is a pot scrubber. It works a little bit like steel wool today, where we can put it down and then grind it in to help get the blackened soot off our pots and pans. Come on, good one. The one for the This is city hall, but it's very small. Look at it. Look at it. Look at it.
Martha without blushing. Just like today, I want a keyboard. Our keyboard is not in alphabetical order, right? It has a like QWERTY yeah. across the top. So the way that you use your type cases, so your vowels, your lowercase e, that was the most used letter, so it's in the largest sort. So the typesetters learn. It is capital U. Exactly. Okay. So Exactly, like these letters here were the least used. That's true. Yeah. Okay. So it would be the case today in our, you know, our uh, nomenclature is that we, <laughs> is that uh, they used to organize the type in the small pieces, right? The, the little ones. That's cool. Yeah, a little fun fact just to add on to that. So how come they didn't put any other combinations of frequently used? I think I see a long hoo down in your chest. Now, because germ theory has really just been discovered, many people don't actually believe in germ theory. Frankly, they see it as a bunch of nonsense. And when you think about it, well, a number of different pieces of technology have just really been created at the time, including, of course, the microscope. And so as a result, most people typically aren't necessarily going to have access to a microscope on a daily basis, right? Certainly not when germ theory is first developed. And so it's really only scientists and doctors that would have access to a microscope. So if I was to come up, on, or come up to you on the street and say, so guess what? There's a bunch of little microorganisms floating around you right now. Now, you can't see them or feel them, but don't worry, I promise you they're there. And they could potentially make you sick. Typically, had been using leeches to do the job. However, by our period, they began to experiment with new pieces of technology, including this one that they've nicknamed the mechanical leech. Now, you could use the mechanical leech in a wide variety of different ways, um, but let's say, for example, you had a headache. In that case, you would stick it up to the temple of the brain, pull this lever, and... See there? Mini saws? Exactly. There's a bunch of little mini blades that come out, right? Mm -hmm. And so that, of course, will cut into the patient's skin. Hello there. How are you there today? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so essentially, it will then allow the patient to bleed out for the next day or so. And of course, the headache will eventually go away. I mean, they may become a little lightheaded, right? And they may not necessarily remember anything for the next week or so. But the important thing is that their headache would be gone, right? Because... Just naturally, it goes. And then they think that it works. Exactly, yes. Yeah. And really, that's really what they're trying to do during this particular period, is they're really trying to try and eliminate the symptoms rather than create cures. Of course, it is always good if they do know of a cure for an ailment, but that isn't necessarily always going to be the case. Uh, this is another form of bloodletting. This is known as cupping. It's a little bit less invasive. And what you would do is you would heat this up, and you would then open up the or roll up the patient's sleeve, stick this onto the skin, and rub it back and forth like this. And essentially what that's going to do is it's going to, if it was hot, it would create a blister. But because it's cool, it's just gonna create a little mark on the skin. And of course, that's going to draw the blood up to the surface of the skin. And of course, in turn, it's gonna make it much easier to create a more controlled bleed. But the main rule to remember though is that a doctor could become a dentist, but a dentist could not become a doctor because of the difference in qualifications. However, a blacksmith could also become a dentist as well. Extraction becomes a major side business for many blacksmiths, and they would use tools like this. This particular one is known as a tooth key, and what essentially you would do is you would wrap the hook around the teeth that needed to be pulled. Pull it out. Like and you would pull down as hard as you could, hope you didn't break the tooth or jaw. It's a lot of hoping during this particular period. Huh. And, of course, then you would extract the tooth. You hope. This is a gentleman by the name of Dr. Lister, 
And during this particular period, a very, very popular form of entertainment was to attend what were known as gas shows. Now, if you've ever attended a hypnotist show, it was a very, very similar concept. Essentially, the presenter would invite several different volunteers up on stage, who would then each receive a dose of the gas, essentially being drugged. And then, of course, the presenter would make them do really, really funny things while under the influence of the gas. Well, Dr. Lister sees this, and of course he begins to think, well, if these individuals don't necessarily have control over their actions when they're under the influence of the gas, is it possible that they also don't necessarily feel pain? Well, though Dr. Lister was never actually able to prove whether or not they could feel pain or not, he did realize that they couldn't remember being in pain, and they were certainly much calmer during surgeries. So gradually, you think, hey, you have a method right, to keep patients calm during surgery. It must be a great idea, right? When this particular piece of technology is actually first created, it's actually not widely liked by the vast majority of surgeons because surgeons during this particular period are used to working on patients while they're awake. And so this idea that essentially now you're working on a patient while they're unconscious seemed very, very unsettling for them. Uh, mainly because, of course, one of the things that they'd be looking out for was, of course, the early signs and telltale signs of shock. And so when they're under anesthetic, of course, those telltale signs essentially go out the window. And so, of course, it became much harder to determine when someone went into shock until they were actually in shock itself. So it would have been quite interesting, as you can imagine. Uh, but gradually, of course, over time, antiseptic does begin to become more and more popular, and gradually more and more doctors begin to use it. Some people actually reject the idea of surgery. Frankly, they see it as much like nonsense. So from anybody to know what we're That's very common, that you have to just tell us the story. Sounds good. <laughs> So welcome everyone to the doctor's office. So this essentially, this particular building never actually originally served as a doctor's office historically. Originally it actually served as a farmhouse and was actually divided to a typical doctor's office of the period. Now during this particular period, it's really just the beginnings of modern science and modern medicine. So as a result, there's a lot of misconception. Health has also just been developed, but because it's just been developed, a lot of people actually reject the idea of term period. Frankly, they see it as a bunch of nonsense. And so if I was to come up and tell you, so guess what? There's a bunch of little microorganisms. There's that aspect. And then there's also the idea that for about to point out centuries, they actually believe in two other theories. The miasma theory, that is the spreading of disease through contaminated or bad air or bad air. Ow! Yes. Ouch! And after a while, of course, their headache would go away. I mean, they may become a little lightheaded and they might not necessarily remember anything for the next week or so. But the important thing is that their headache would be gone, right? So it's actually right. help, it's actually help huh? Not really, though, but that, that was the thing meant that either the person was already sick or would be sick in the next few days. Now, there was a number of different ways that they could try and balance out those humors, but by far the most popular way was through bloodletting. So this one, uh, this little device here goes by the nickname, the Mechanical Leech, and... Oh, this is your king gola.
，係啦。其實嗰間黃色屋係喺佢屋企，呢間黃色屋係喺條街對面。係啊，跟住我哋呢日開嚟入睇下一個就，跟住呢個佢個鋪頭，嗰、那個佢住嗰間屋。咁古怪，其實間屋同鋪。嗯，係啊。啱先嗰間屋咪邊間屋啊？哦 ，fresh bread， thank you。Any specific instruction on how to enjoy it? Uh, well, a lot of people like butter, but uh, okay. I like that. I like to eat it just straight up. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay, great. Thank uh, you. It doesn't have any preservatives in it, so if you're not going to finish it all within a couple of days, um, you might want to freeze part of it. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Bread we bought. Give it, give it. Five bucks, no preservatives, and best with butter, nothing else. Can you tell AE Patina? This place feels very homey. Oh, does it? Yeah. We got ready to decorate it over the winter time, so it's a whole new layout. It does definitely suits the whole theme of the Oh outside? Yeah, it does. Mm. Wait, there's stuff inside of it. It's like little balls. Can you tell me something? What's that? Books and some board games, I guess? Yeah, board games. Thank you. 